welcome to the Proterozoic. So the Proterozoic is a long period of time in Earth's history. We can see it goes all the way from 2.5 billion years ago to 541 million years ago. And that's 42% of Earth's history. And somehow I'm going to do that in just a few minutes to cover that few billion years. All right. Uh, when we talked about the Archean, we saw that the Archean was an alien world, right? We had this, this ocean with high amounts of dissolved uh, iron, and we had an atmosphere that we wouldn't be able to breathe. Even the rocks were different because we had those um, green stones and granite and nice complexes and things like that. Well, the Proterozoic is different because now we're going to start getting things more like today. Uh, we get continents growing larger, we get continental shelves, these shallow bodies of water next to the continents, and we start getting more carbonate rocks and more uh, mature sandstones, more quartz-rich, well-rounded sandstones because we're starting to have periods of um, erosion happening to all those rocks that were created in the Archean. Now, the Proterozoic is broken down into a few different uh, um, sections. Uh, remember your Greek root words, right? Paleo, Meso, and Neo. So we have the Paleo Proterozoic, Meso Proterozoic, and Neo Proterozoic, the Ancient, Middle, and New. Just to visually remind you guys of uh, what time period we're talking about, right? There's where Earth begins, here's where we are today. This time period, this whole big time period, is the time period we're talking about. So, tectonically, in the Paleoproterozoic, what's going on is Laurentia, which is uh, the, um, uh, the continent of North America, that's what we call North America, is Laurentia, and this is assembling together. Right? So we have all these little crustal pieces that developed during the um, uh, Archean, and now those little pieces are getting put together um, into Laurentia, the continent of North America. So we have a bunch of cratons, and you can see that these are the names of some of our cratons, and then in between those cratons, we have origins, right, orogenies, because when these things hit each other, we get mountain building events going on. And so these orogenic rocks can uh, preserve some interesting information about plate tectonics. And so we can see that during the um, Proterozoic, our uh, plate tectonics is operating much like it does today, because we can see things like the Wilson cycle preserved in the rocks. And remember, the Wilson cycle is where rocks and, or, I'm having a little cat issue where a cat is climbing up my curtains. Sorry. But anyway, um, <laughs> so anyway, um, the Wilson cycle, remember, is where you get a rift developing, a continent breaks apart, a larger ocean basin forms, and then eventually subduction begins. Those continents come together and crash into each other once again, right? Ocean basin opens and closes. And we're starting to see that in these rocks. And um, so that's telling us that plate tectonics at this time is quite a bit like the modern plate tectonics. And so as our Laurentia assembles, what we're seeing here, here's our Archean cratons in that color there. And then in the purple, those are some of the um, orogenies where these came together. And then on top of that, the, remember the concept of suture zones, where things get sutured, they get stuck together, and that's what we're seeing right here. And uh, one of the biggest suture zones that really made uh, Laurentia grow much larger at this point in time is this trans-Hudson orogeny, because we have these two giant pieces coming together, making our um, early continent of North America. Later on in the uh, Proterozoic, we have additional terrains get added 
to North America, um, making Laurentia grow even larger. Also in the Proterozoic, or in fact the Paleoproterozoic, Earth experiences its our first known ice age. Now I'm not saying there weren't ice ages before this, we just have no evidence of any prior to this. And this first ice age occurs 2.3 billion years ago. And the record of it here in uh, North America is the Galgonda Formation. And the Galgonda Formation has two types of rocks that are unique to glaciers. And that's tillites and then these varved mudstones. So tillites, um, that's the lithified version of till. Remember from physical geology, till is the material that gets dropped directly from the ice as it melts. So it's very unsorted and it's unstratified, much like this Galgonda tillite that we see right here. Another typical thing you see in glacial areas are varved mudstones. So varves recall are those seasonal layers, the summer and winter layers. And what we're seeing in this particular varved sand, uh, mudstone, we see the light and dark seasonal layers, and then we also see this little thing, it's called a dropstone. It's where uh, there was some uh, ice that had a, a pebble in it, and as that ice melted, it dropped that uh, stone in there. So in any case, 2.3 uh, billion years ago, we have this ice age, and we know that this was a global ice age. It did not just affect North America. We find similar rocks like those tillites in Australia, in Finland, in India, and uh, several parts of Africa. Another important aspect of the Paleoproterozoic are these banded iron formations. Most banded iron formations were deposited between 2.5 and 1.8 billion years ago. And there's a beautiful banded iron formation with our red shirts and our darker iron bearing minerals. Um, and this formed during this uh, concept of the great oxidation event when uh, our atmosphere started getting oxygenated. And as the atmosphere began getting oxygenated, these banded iron formations either chemically or biochemically precipitated. In fact, it's probably both. And so chemically they would precipitate because that iron would bond with the uh, uh, molecular oxygen and become insoluble and precipitate directly out of the water. However, in many banded iron formations, there are some fossils found that resemble modern bacteria that actually precipitate iron compounds. So it is thought there was some biologic input into creating these banded iron formations as well. Where does the, all that iron in the oceans end up coming from? Well, it probably comes from two main sources. Uh, volcanic activity, when you have like underwater hot springs occurring, they actually um, discharge a lot of iron. But then we also would have had weathering occurring on the, uh, on the continents, on the land, and that weathering would be carrying iron into the world's oceans as well. So again, it's probably a combination of both of these things, although many, many banded iron formations do seem to have some volcanic um, aspect to them. Um, as I was saying, we call this time when all of these things are forming the Great Oxidation Event, and um, uh, because all of these, uh, this iron is oxidizing, basically it's rusting, becoming insoluble, and precipitating into the oceans. In the Paleoproterozoic, we also have a few major meteorite impacts at this time. And uh, one of those is here in North America. It's called the Sudbury Complex. About 1.85 billion years ago, um, a meteorite hit there and it created a crater that's 250 kilometers in diameter. 
Now, unfortunately, you can't really visit this crater like you can Meteor Crater in Arizona and stand there and look at this thing because after 1.85 billion years, we end up, um, you know, having quite a bit of weathering and erosion and younger rocks and even burying parts of this. So you don't get to see this uh, crater as, as distinctly as younger craters. Uh, this was a massive impact. It must have been if it created a crater. And wh where we can see this crater is using geophysics and looking into the subsurface. And anyway, to create a crater that size, 250 kilometers in diameter, this had to be a heck of an impact. And in fact, ejecta, material that got blasted out of the, uh, the crater when it was formed is found 800 kilometers away in Minnesota. And molten rock from this impact, because of course you're going to have a lot of heat involved with something that size hitting the earth, and that's going to end up uh, creating quite a bit of melt. And this molten rock from that impact is enriched in some interesting minerals like nickel, copper, platinum, palladium, and gold. And in fact, in Sudbury, Ontario, there are major nickel mines because of the uh, material created in that impact event. We have another major meteorite impact occurred to uh, just over 2 billion years ago. And this is the Vredefort complex. This is an even larger crater, 300 kilometers in diameter. And this is in South Africa. That's where this one's located. And ejecta was found as far as uh, 2,500 kilometers away in Russia. Now, granted, continents and stuff were assembled in a little different way at that time, but still we have ejecta a significant distance away, which tells you this was a large impact event. And um, again, it's old, so a lot of the crater has been erased by erosion, but we can still see some of that crater right here. See that nice circular pattern? That's the edges of your Vredefort crater in South Africa. Now, in physical geology, you guys learned about supercontinents, the times when all continents are together. And I'm sure you learned about Pangaea. Well, Pangaea was not the only supercontinent ever to exist. It's simply the most recent one. It's all the way back in the Paleoproterozoic when we have our first supercontinent. And this is, depending who you decide to talk to, either called Nuna or Columbia, you know, synonyms, they're annoying because you have to remember two different names then. Well, anyway, Nuna or Columbia is the first supercontinent we have to exist. Assembly was complete by about 1.8 billion years ago. And this is the uh, basic reconstruction of our uh, continent of Columbia or Nuna. And it's in Norwegian because it was the only one that I could find that looked nice. So let me translate for you. Laurentia, that's the same in Norwegian and American uh, English. Um, so we have Laurentia sitting right up here. There's Greenland. This thing called Baltica, that's Europe. Here's Siberia. And um, East Antarctica is there. This is South China. The Kalahari is part of Africa. There's Western Australia, um, there's Northern Australia, and there's Southern Australia. Uh, there's India, there's North China, there's Western Africa, and this is South America. So you can see a very different way that the uh, continent was set up at that time. But that's all of the continent masses that existed at this time together in a single supercontinent. But this supercontinent one thing about them is they break up eventually. They're like boy bands. They come together, do their thing, and then they break up. And uh, Nuna, or Columbia, broke up around 1.4 billion years ago. Laurentia rifted off and ended up being located for a while in the southern hemisphere. Now, as we 
have moved into the Mesoproterozoic. There's some fascinating events that happen on Laurentia in the Mesoproterozoic, and one of these is the Mid-Continent Rift that lasted from about 1.2 to 1 uh, billion years ago. And this was a major, major rifting event where Laurentia almost tore itself into two different continents. And this rift filled with flood basalt. So basically you had a number of fissures open up, uh, fissures being giant cracks that lava comes out of, and these, um, this basaltic lava um, acted like a flood, right? It just started covering everything. And some of these flood basalts in the mid-continent rift are anywhere from 5 to 25 kilometers thick of basalts there. And more than just the fact that North America was trying to rip itself into two, um, because of these basalts and then the later history of the mid-continent rift, this ended up hosting the world's largest native copper deposits. Now, native copper is pure copper. And at this place, in this location, um, you can just find, you could find large masses of absolutely pure copper. In fact, the largest mass of pure native copper found was about the size of a school bus. Now, if you go to Duluth, Minnesota, you'll see the Duluth Gabbro. And this is the intrusive equivalent of these basalts. Remember intrusive, that's the igneous rock that forms underground. So that's really part of the magma chamber that then fed the basalt to the surface to be the, um, uh, the mid-continent rift filling basalts. And this Duluth Gabbro is quite big, it tells us we had a large magma chamber feeding this whole system. This is the extent of the mid-continent rift system. Um, we know that it's buried down here in Kansas. We can see it using geophysics. And then once we get up into this part of the world, into the upper peninsula of Michigan, the mid-continent rift rocks are exposed at Earth's surface, and then they are once again underground when we reach the lower peninsula of Michigan. Now, the weird thing about the mid-continent rift, just when we look at the massive amount of lava that was erupted, this suggests this was a very, very well-developed rift, and it suggests that the, the continent really almost split apart. It almost formed something like the Red Sea today. But why didn't it? Well, the answer to why North America didn't split apart comes to the Grenville orogeny. Um, Grenville rocks extend all the way from Labrador in Canada to here in Texas. If we'd been able to take the uh, Hill Country field trip, I would have had you guys standing on some Grenville rocks. Now what then occurred was you had this rift trying to form, but then you had this collision on the east coast of North America with another landmass that basically slammed that rift shut and prevented the rift from fully developing and uh, breaking North America into two pieces. Now, the landmass that hit was Amazonia. And just like Laurentia is the name for North America, Amazonia is the name for South America. So Amazonia slammed into the east coast of North America and closed the mid-continent rift. In addition to closing the mid-continent rift, it ended up forming a large mountain range. If you do go to the hill country in Texas, and uh, you go to places like Enchanted Rock, or you see all those, those beautiful hills of granite and stuff in the hill country, you're looking at some of the Grenville aged rocks here in Texas. Anyway, this collision that formed this big Grenville mountain range was part of the assembly of our next supercontinent. And our next supercontinent is called Rodinia. As I said, this pushed the mid-continent rift closed. And on our map now, we have 
Laurentia here and these rocks right there, those are the Grenville rocks created as uh, Amazonia collided with North America. Now we're going to enter, we're going to leave the Mesoproterozoic and enter the Neoproterozoic. And I think I'm going to leave that for Volume 2. So hang on to your butts, we got to start another, uh, uh, another video in just a few minutes.